William Clark's career after his expedition with Meriwether Lewis. And at midnight Eastern, Blood Done Sign My Name, author Timothy Tyson on the murder that sparked the civil rights movement in Oxford, North Carolina. In Opening Mexico, co-authors Julia Preston and Samuel Dillon look at the history of democracy in the country. This talk is an hour and a half. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In this very, very warm evening, uh, if anybody, if the gentlemen are wearing a coat and you want to take it right off, uh, this is in the family. I'm Walt Cutler. I'm president of Meridian International Center, and I am here to welcome you, but also uh, uh, to welcome our distinguished uh, uh, speakers, our authors. This is one of Meridian's authors' evenings, and we're very, very pleased to be uh, presenting this program tonight in cooperation with the Cultural Institute of Mexico. Uh, as you know, many of you have visited that institute. It's right up, it's right up the street, uh, and it's a wonderful institution. Uh, <clears throat> You'll hear more about that later. Uh, our authors, of course, are Julia Preston and Samuel Dillon, Opening Mexico, The Making of a Democracy. And uh, also, I'm pleased to uh, welcome Ambassador Eduardo Ibarola, uh, who is the Deputy Chief of, Mexi uh, of the Admission at the Mexican Embassy here in Washington. Welcome. And also Alejandro Negrin, who's the Director of the Mexican Cultural Institute. I thanks to our volunteers, Aaron Barnes, Elizabeth Latham, and Berenice Sanchez. And uh, as traditional with these programs, uh, the authors will be available after the program during our reception to uh, sign uh, their, their wonderful book, which will be on sale in the, uh, in the loggia. I would like to introduce our guest moderator and host this evening, Ambassador Jim Jones, somebody who knows Mexico well. He was our American ambassador to Mexico, 1993 to 1997. Very, very busy, active years in Mexican-U.S. relations, NAFTA, the Mexican peso crisis, and other is such issues. Uh, before that, for four years, he was chairman and chief executive officer of the American Stock Exchange. And before that, uh, for a number of years, he was a uh, representative uh, from Oklahoma in the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives, where he was chairman of the House Budget Committee. Uh, but his public service started in his early 20s when he was the appointment secretary, now called chief of staff position, for President Lyndon Johnson. He's a native of Oklahoma, he's a graduate of Georgetown Law School, and now he is uh, co-chairman and CEO of Manat Jones Global Strategies, uh, based here in Washington, and a company that is involved in all kinds of international trade and investment issues and business government relations. And not least at all is the fact that Ambassador Jones is the chairman of Meridian's Board of uh, Trustees. Please join me in welcoming our guest moderator, <clears throat> Ambassador Jim Jones. Thank you all. Thank you, very Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Walt Cutler, who's the president and, and uh, longtime president, distinguished leader of Meridian International, and welcome to all of you. Uh, this is a particularly uh, good evening for me because I came to know the authors uh, when they were uh, covering Mexico as the New York Times Bureau, uh, when I was down there as ambassador part of the time, and I've read their book, and the first thing I would say, it's, it's a good read. Oftentimes, uh, colleagues of mine, friends of mine, uh, write books, and it's uh, sort of a rehash of what they have written as either journalists or speeches they've given as congressmen or what have you. Uh, this is not that kind of a book. It really is a very good book. Uh, a good read, and it uh, talks about Mexico up to the present time in a way that lets you understand 
the enormous changes and, and basically peaceful revolution that has occurred in that country uh, up to the present. When I went to Mexico as ambassador, I was astounded to find out so many Americans, including officials in Washington, uh, their view of Mexico was a 40-year-old Anthony Quinn movie. And it was a very frustrating thing to me to be able to, to try to give sort of a kindergarten explanation of Mexico, its past, and try to bring them up to date of the enormous changes that were taking place in that country. And so I think just from that standpoint alone, it is, it's, a, it's a good read. Uh, they show respect for Mexico, for Mexicans, uh, for the culture, for the progress, uh, that that country has made in, in moving toward full uh, first world uh, respectability. But they also uh, are able to deliver searing critiques of where that progress has fallen short. Uh, I'm going to introduce both of the authors and they will speak in turn. Um, and, and then I want to introduce Ambassador Iberola and then we'll go into questions and comments from the floor. Julia Preston is uh, at currently the New York Times federal courts reporter in New York City. She has had a very interesting and varied degree at, at, at experiences in her profession. She came to the Times in 1995, and she and Sam Dillon covered Mexico for the next five years. Uh, one of the reasons perhaps this book is so good, they were able, it looks like they took a year off because they were recipients of the MacArthur Foundation Research and Writing uh, Grant, which allowed them to go not just in what they had done in, uh, in their reporting time in Mexico, but to go into even greater depth to, re to research for this book. Uh, she, uh, uh, at the New York Times, has held a number of posts since, uh, since being uh, in Mexico. She was the deputy investigations editor editor on the Foreign Desk, uh, the Bureau Chief for the New York Times at the United Nations and covered the Security Council and the, the Iraq debates, etc. Uh, before that, she was in, at the Washington Post. She was uh, covered Latin America and again the United Nations. And she was Bureau Chief in Miami, uh, where she covered a great deal of Central America. And she also was at the Boston Globe and National Public Radio before that. Many awards she's won. For example, in 1994, she was the winner of the Robert F. Kennedy Award for Humanitarian Journalism. In 1997, received the uh, Maria Moore's uh, Cabot Prize for Distinguished Coverage of Latin America. And then, of course, in 1998, was a Pulitzer Prize winner as part of the reporting team from the New York Times that did their series on the uh, corrosive effects of drug corruption in Mexico. The other author, uh, Sam Dillon, began uh, his Latin American reporting in 1981. He covered the Civil War in El Salvador uh, for the Associated Press and then was, uh, uh, became the bureau chief for the Miami Herald. He was a New York Times reporter on the uh, foreign desk and uh, covered a number of major events for them. He um, uh, was, uh, he covered the Al-Qaeda currently, since, since Mexico, I might bring you up to date. He's been on the foreign desk at the New York Times. He's covered the Al-Qaeda arrests in Spain, and uh, he's covered the sex abuse scandal in the Catholic Church. He's currently the national education correspondent for the New York Times covering trends in public education, and higher education. He, too, has won a number of awards. In uh, 1998, he, he was also a part of the New York Times staff that won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, he, in 1987, won another Pulitzer Prize at the Miami Herald, was one of the six reporters for their coverage of the Iran-Contra affair. Also, he, in 1988, he won the Inter-American Press Association's top prize for political reporting in 89. His book, uh, Commandos, the CIA, and Nicaragua's uh, Contra Rebels, won the Overseas Press Club uh, uh, Award for the best book on foreign affairs. 
So as you can see, our two authors have spent a great deal of their careers in Latin America, but, uh, but they have also had wonderful experiences uh, outside of that region also. So it's a great pleasure for me to welcome both of them to Meridian, and I'll call on Julia first to, for her comments. Thank you. I want to thank Ambassador Jones for introducing us. Um, it's really a privilege to be introduced uh, by him. He uh, was an ambassador who not only uh, helped Mexico to um, uh, participate in NAFTA and, and was a, an important force in major changes that have taken place in Mexico, but he also was an ambassador who came to really uh, love and feel a bond with the country and and as we do and so it's really an honor thank you very much and thank you for coming um, writing a book is um, turned out to be very hard work and there were times when we you know wondered why are we doing this and the idea that we had was so that people who love Mexico and care about Mexico would read it and get a new idea and 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 help to that we would help to form a new image of this country and so here you are the readers that we wrote this book for and we're very grateful that you came um, uh, in opening Mexico Sam and I use the term slow motion peaceful democratic revolution to describe the political process that culminated on the night of the presidential election in Mexico on July 2nd 2000 revolution is a big word Perhaps the political scientists will object that we use it so confidently. But we feel it is right because we remember what it was like to be newspaper reporters that night in Mexico City. We remember the suspense. Throughout the evening, as we were hunched over our keyboards in the New York Times Bureau in Mexico City, the story was still evolving. We were writing new leads on our stories every hour or so. Could it really be, we wondered, that the improbable campaign of Vicente Fox, a vegetable farmer and former Coca-Cola executive who had based his presidential bid on a, on a simple promise of change, could it be that Fox would really triumph at the polls? Could it be that the Institutional Revolutionary Party, after decades of making off with elections by fraud and chicanery, would really this time refrain and concede? in the vote? Could it really be that Mexico's election system, on which Mexicans had lavished years of reform efforts and more than $1.2 billion, would re really withstand the pre's attempts at fiddling? Sam and I didn't know whether the story that we would be writing that night would be yet another round of electoral conflict and political mayhem, or the beginning of a new era in Mexico. Of course, everyone knows how it came out. Fox won by a decisive margin, eight points, in the cleanest election ever in Mexico. The PRI, led by its president, Ernesto Cedillo, stood aside. The election was so soundly organized that major fraud was Im simply impossible. By 11.30 that night, Jose Waldenberg, the president of the Elections Council, gaveled the session to a close and told the council members to go home. There was no crisis for them to manage. Sam and I wrote our news stories and our analyses. The next day, we filed more stories uh, from Mexico about the official tally, and they were on the front page of the New York Times. But after that, the world moved on. Yet we knew that the significance of the election's outcome was enormous. When the pre-system was unseated at the polls, it had given Mexico 12 consecutive presidents and had been in power for 71 years, making it the longest ruling political regime in the world. It was the first time, the first time in Mexican history that state power had been transferred from the rulers to the opposition peacefully by means of free elections with full suffrage. Think about that for a minute, something that is so routine in the United States. This was the first time that this kind of political change had been accomplished peacefully in Mexico. Order and civility were the hallmarks of the consolidation of Mexican democracy, a country that had entered the 20th century with a bloody revolution in which more than a million of its citizens were killed. 
stepped decorously into the new millennium with another one in which not a single shot was fired in anger. Mexico, too often regarded by Americans as a passel of pistoleros and greasy-palmed politicians and drug dons and wetbacks, had something to show the world about peaceful democratic change. The July 2000 election was not only about the charisma and campaign talent of Vicente Fox, although these had been prodigious. Sam and I realized that we had witnessed the culmination of three decades of determined, patient, and often dangerous work by many Mexicans in the elite, in the grassroots, on the left, on the right, at the center, in the, uh, in the provinces to bring greater freedom to their country, to carry out Mexico's apertura, its opening. We understood that the main protagonists and the heroes of this opening had been hard to spot. Mexico's transition was difficult to follow because there was no Nelson Mandela, no Lejualenza, no single leader to personify and guide the struggle. The internal decay and collapse of the public credibility of the pre's authoritarian system was marked by many traumatic events, the bank nationalization of 1982, the assassination in 1994, uh, 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 I'm sorry, 1994 of pre-candidate Luis Donaldo Colosio, the peso crisis of 95, the corruption scandals of Raul Salinas, to name a few. But the impact of the efforts of Mexican citizens and political leaders to make democracy did not become clear until they came to fruition on the night of July 2nd, 2000. For so long under the PRI, Mexico had called itself a democracy consistent with the PRI regime's remarkable capability to use political illusion as a tool of self-perpetuation. Today, Mexico actually has most of the working parts of a democracy in place and running. President Fox is chosen by the voters and accountable in broad terms to them, as his successor will be also. Mexican voters wasted no time in confronting Fox with this new reality when, in the midterm elections in July of 2003, they registered their disappointment with his performance by giving the PRI his nemesis, a plurality in the lower house of Congress, and giving the combined opposition a majority. There is a combative legislature to check the president's power, too combative, some would say. The Supreme Court is undertaking a worthy struggle to overcome a sad history of subservience to political power and working to become more independent, professional, and nonpartisan. Three, political, three major political parties are in play, representing authentic swaths of the Mexican electorate. A broad process of federalization has taken place, devolving many political powers and some spending powers back down to state governors, a crucial evolution in a country as diverse as Mexico. The society is filled with loud and energetic civic groups pushing their issues, from human and Indian rights to land tenure disputes, to teachers' wages, to relief for victims of crime. And anyone who reads Spanish and has spent a day in Mexico City knows that there is undeniably a free press. The newspapers and television newscasts in Mexico are carrying on a highly opinionated shouting match and often, uh, that is always interesting, if not always informative. As Sam and I contemplated the fall of the pre, we realized that the heroes and the villains of this change were Mexicans that we had met in the course of our everyday reporting. Our book is not scholarly, although it is well sourced. Rather, we wrote a history of Mexicans opening with an emphasis on the story, a narrative who, whose goal was to weave together the life stories of grassroots activists and the political biographies of the powerful to show how the collective accumulation of reformist effort came together over time to impel peaceful change. Last but not least, we hoped as journalists to make a contribution to clarifying the historic record of some events. Our book is broken down in phases, and I'll just mention them briefly. Um, we really start our story in 1968, the year of the, uh, the massacre of students in Tlatelolco Square in Mexico City. Uh, 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 the events of 68 really marked the Mexican people in, a, in, a, in, a, in an especially concentrated way. That was a very tumultuous year around the world. But in Mexico, uh, the, the, the massacre in Tlatelolco Square really... Um, uh, uh, showed a whole generation of Mexicans uh, 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 um, the, 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 the violent core of the authoritarian system. It, it, it was the first time when there was a, a, a whole generation that 
that broke faith with the possibilities of change uh, within the system. Um, uh, in addition to which, the um, the events of the uh, of, of uh, October second and the massacre that took place became part of the opening because they remained secret for for uh, not for for decades. And then Mexican researchers and journalists and scholars um, began. Uh, uh, digging to find out what did actually happen. And 30 years uh, later, while we were there in Mexico in 1998, uh, Sam uh, uh, wrote a, uh, a number of stories about uh, what Mexicans had learned about the process. And it turned out that, um, um, uh, that President uh, Gustavo Díaz Ordaz, who was the president at, at the time, had actually ordered uh, elite army um, unit, uh, snipers from an elite army unit to uh, a fire down uh, on not only the student protesters in the square, but also on other army troops so that it would appear to be um, the students who had started the violence uh, in the square that day. So, so this, the, the, the violence and then the process of disclosure was really a very central to to the uh, a part of the opening in Mexico. After 68, the next major moment um, in the democratic opening came in 1985. There was a huge earthquake in downtown Mexico City. And uh, the government was paralyzed by the extent of the damage. Uh, this was a, the, the, the nature of the authoritarian system was it, it was very discouraging to grassroots activism. Uh, the PRI did not like uh, people to mobilize outside of its own uh, forms of organization, tightly controlled forms of organization. And after the earthquake, within the, uh, the, 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 the days after the earthquake, people rushed out into the street uh, to, um, in the face of the paralysis of the government, to begin digging in the rubble to look for their survivors and to um, recover the remains of their dead. And it, it came to a kind of a confrontation uh, between the government, which was most anxious to to raise buildings that had been ruined and kind of move on, and um, and people who were uh, 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 anxious to to uh, recover their uh, the victims of this uh, of the earthquake, and it was really the beginning of what we call civil society in Mexico. It was an experience in which people learned for the first time that you could have a community organization in a neighborhood, that people could go out, for example, and and, and stand in front of a bulldozer that uh, the government had sent in to raise a hospital or raise a public building that had been damaged and stop that bulldozer from, from, from coming forward. And so this was the moment when, when you know, non-governmental community organization first began to appear in Mexico. Um, after 85, we, um, we go to 1988, which was the year of the uh, uh, election uh, contest between Carlos Salinas and a man named Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas, who was a man of the left. He had been part of the authoritarian system, and he broke with it. And it was an election that was marked by rampant fraud. It uh, is the year, 1988 is the year in Mexico that uh, when people uh, say, se cayó el sistema, that the computer crashed. And uh, Sam did the reporting for that chapter. It turned out uh, when he started to get into it that that the people didn't the, in Mexico didn't actually really know what had happened that night, and and there was a whole myth that uh, that uh, the government had set up the Interior Ministry had set up a computer to 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 tally the votes, and that at a certain point it had emerged that Salinas was not going to win, and they'd stopped this computer and they'd stopped the vote count, and they'd gone in and done this cyber fraud and let the thing and then and then come out with new results. Well, it turned out that it was actually. Uh, a, uh, a both a more complex and a simpler story. It was the the fraud. The, uh, there was a computer. Uh, there was a fraud, but the fraud was really an old time fraud uh, of of uh, of preoperatives across the country going in and you know adding zeros to the to the tally uh, uh, of the pre and and stuffing ballot boxes and doing stuff that they'd been doing for uh, that they had really perfected. Um, uh, uh, the other thing that's significant about so anyway, if you read the book, you could find out uh, a new version, a new account of what did actually happen in 1988. Um, in addition to which, this was the year when Cardenas, uh, at a certain point, his followers um, were um, 
uh, calling out to Cardenas to to rebel, to resist uh, the imposition of Salinas. They re they regarded, uh, they believed that Cardenas had won, and uh, they there was a moment when 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 Cardenas appeared in the Socalo in Mexico City, and his followers were calling out to for for him to to summon them to an uprising, and 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 he basically he held out his hands like this, and he just said no no. We we need to we need to take this we need to form a political party we need to take this movement into more into peaceful means of change and part of what we do in our book is show how that happened over and over again there were Mexicans frequently had options to for to to opt for for violence to opt for um, disorganized change and time and time again they uh, chose to build institutions they chose to to um, reform the elections process. They chose to build political parties. They chose to try and uh, make a stronger Congress. Um, this is one of the themes of the book. Um, we talk, we write about Carlos Salinas. Uh, um, um, Salinas, uh, we, we, we think of Salinas, uh, I mean, uh, people in this country knew Salinas both because of the, the glory days of the passage of NAFTA and then his dramatic fall from grace. Um, what we do in the book is show how Salinas governed and the way that over the period of time uh, that he was president, he, he concentrated power, more and more power. He eroded the underpinnings of uh, even of pre-authority in the country and concentrated it more and more in his hands. So, so uh, in, uh, I mean, the, we have ample uh, material in the book about the uh, about the corruption in the Salinas regime, but but we really look at Salinas as an example of a president who attempted to make an economic opening with NAFTA, but not a genuine political opening. And what what happened? Uh, and then we we write about Ernesto Cedillo, the paradoxical president of the pre Cedillo, who who really was the accidental president. He he comes to power. Uh, he becomes the presidential candidate because of the assassination of the man who was really supposed to be uh, the presidential candidate. And Cedillo, the, 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 the trauma of uh, the events of 1994, um, um, really impressed on Cedillo that the old system was really not working uh, anymore to, 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 to control and transfer power in Mexico. And we show how Cedillo, um, really in a quite a determined way, um, uh, carried out campaign finance and and other kinds of electoral reforms that really made it possible to level the playing field and and give uh, Fox a chance to win. Um, we write about heroes in our book, um, and um, uh, I, I I'll just mention one to uh, understand is a man named Luis H. Alvarez. Don Luis was a um, textile manufacturer from Chihuahua, and uh, Don Luis. Among other things, ran again, ran for president against the PRI in uh, 1958 when that was considered to be a, a, a lunatic thing to do. When the, the, this was a party that that at that in that period of time was winning 98 percent of the valid votes cast in a presidential election. Uh, Don Luis carried out a hunger strike in Chihuahua in 1986 uh, in the square in Chihuahua, and his he's a very gentlemanly, white-haired guy, and his. His presence in the square, in, 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 in this tent in the square in Chihuahua to protest electoral fraud, it proved to be a, a magnet for intellectuals uh, of the left. It was a moment when, when across the political spectrum, people came together, uh, united uh, uh, to, to understand the possibilities uh, uh, that the, uh, the, the that the pre could be overthrown, that democratic change could take place peacefully in Mexico. Uh, uh, we write about Sergio Aguayo, who was a man who started out his life in a street gang in Guadalajara and went on to become a PhD uh, from Johns Hopkins University. He, Sergio, among the many his many accomplishments, was he organized a nationwide movement of poll watchers, people who would just go to the polling place and just make it physically impossible by their presence for the PRI to carry out the type of subversion of the electoral process that, that they had. Um, um, our book is a great rarity, which is an essentially optimistic book about Mexico. Uh, but we recognize that crippling problems remain. Um, Fox, brilliant as he was in campaign, has proven to be 
a surprisingly ineffective chief executive. His unpersuasive performance is a serious problem for the fledgling democracy in Mexico, where the political system still revolves around the president, and Mexicans still expect their president, to a certain extent, to be a caudillo, a, a, a strong man. Uh, early in his term, Fox squandered his electoral mandate from optimistic voters by making a half-hearted legislative alliance with the old system, with the, with the pre, abandoning his core promise of change for a pact with the devil that produced few results. Fox also failed to marshal the disciplined support of his own querulous party, the PAN, leaving the field open for his congressional opponents in, the, uh, in other parties to block him at every turn. Uh, and we can talk some more about this. There are uh, reforms that, that Mexico really needs, an educational reform, a tax reform. Fox has not been able to make progress on that, and it is, it, it is, it's a serious problem at this point for Mexico. Uh, because of the strength of the new democracy and because of its weaknesses, the United States needs urgently to give new priority to this country. To state what should be obvious, we share a 2,000-mile border with Mexico. It is a treaty-privileged trading partner, one of our very largest trading partners. More than 8 million Mexicans now work without documents in this country. The United States has a, a strategic national security interest in the economic stability and democratic progress in Mexico. The Bush administration has stated that promoting democracy is the central goal of its foreign policy. And yet, in the wake of the September 11th attacks, Mexico, our oil exporting neighbor, which carried out a democratic transformation that did not cost the American taxpayers $80 billion, was remanded to the back row. The diplomatic framework is already in place for negotiations on the extraordinarily complex bilateral issues that arise from immigration, from border security, to name just a few. A nation that has been called our distant neighbor has taken a giant step closer to our core political values. It's a change that we must recognize and reward. Thank you, Thank you Julia. And now the co-author, Sam Dillon. And while Sam is getting to the, to the podium, I might ask if any in, in Meridian staff knows where the air conditioning unit is and maybe get a little more air. Does anybody know? See if you can. Okay. Ambassador Jones, thanks for your wonderful introduction. Thanks for the Meridian International Center for having us. A special greeting to Eduardo Ibarrola who we knew as an eminent lawyer in Mexico when we were based there. He is one of the most helpful and knowledgeable officials that we encountered. We owe him many thanks for the insights he gave us. It seems a very long time ago now, but think back with me for a minute to the year 2000. There were two nations in North America that had presidential elections that year. In one country, there was turmoil. The ballot counting dragged on for five weeks. There were charges of fraud. In the other country, there were no charges of fraud. The authorities announced the results quickly and accurately. The losing candidate accepted his defeat graciously. And the winner, a man named Vicente Fox, was magnanimous in his victory. Think for a minute about those results. The elections in the United States, which considers itself to be the world's premier democracy, were an embarrassment. And the elections in Mexico were exemplary. That is an extraordinary role reversal. Mexico's entire modern political culture has been shaped by fraud. Even Mexican Spanish is rich with a vocabulary of fraud. This is sort of like snow. The Eskimos have 100 words for snow, right? In Mexico, they have words relating to vote fraud. Words like alquimista, the alchemist. In Mexico, the alchemist is a guy who slips in behind the scenes after the voting has happened and rigs the election for the ruling party. He turns the lead of defeat into the gold of victory. Well, in 2000, this kind of arcane vocabulary of 
disputed elections emerged not in Mexico, but in Florida. It was in Florida where we had the hanging chad and we had the butterfly ballot. In 2000, in Mexico, there were no hanging chads and there were no alchemists. There were just honest elections. So what are we talking about? We're talking about a kind of democratic revolution that occurred in Mexico. Now, that's a very sweeping phrase, as Julia mentioned. Are we, co are we correct in applying it to Mexico? What's changed and what has remained the same four years later? Someone once asked Cho N. Lai to evaluate the impact of the 1789 French Revolution. Someone once asked Cho N. Lai to evaluate the impact of the 1789 French Revolution. It's too early to tell, he said. <laughs> In Mexico, things have become clear more quickly. Four years later, we can say that because of what's happened in Mexico, it's less authoritarian, less presidential, less centralized, and more open to the world than ever before. And, mox and democracy has made an important difference in some areas. But let's talk for a little while about the bad news. What hasn't changed? For one thing, the country's weak systems of accountability. What are the headlines coming out of Mexico these days? They focus on videotapes that concern or that uh, illustrate politicians many of whom emerged in this struggle for democracy, accepting bribes on camera. It's a disappointing thing to watch. It's not terribly surprising. Democracy hasn't abolished all greed. But clearly, Mexico needs to build stronger systems for holding corrupt officials accountable. What's the larger problem of accountability? The legal system itself doesn't work very well yet. The problems are multiple. Only a tiny proportion of the crimes committed are ever reported, and an even smaller percentage of those that are reported are investigated and punished. Three or four years ago, a couple of academics studied Mexico's police academies. They found that the cadets were being taught right in the academies how to shake citizens down for bribes. The prosecutors called Ministerios Públicos are undertrained and underpaid. The 500 federal judges are much more professional and better paid, but they face a daunting problem occasionally with the, the, judicial, the system itself in its functionings. So reforming and strengthening the law enforcement and justice system remains one of the most uh, pressing issues on the Mexican agenda. There's mixed news on the, about the narcotics trade. Obviously, the river of drugs that flows northward from Mexico to satisfy U.S. demand still flows. The, the Times correspondents who replaced us in Mexico have written some interesting stories about the news being good. There have been top traffickers in all the major cartels that have been jailed. During the first years of the Fox administration, it appeared that the ties that were forged between the drug mafias and federal officials were unraveling. There are signs now that the traffickers may be knitting them back again, this time with people in Fox's party. It's hard to overstate the power that American consumption of cocaine bestows upon the traffickers. They may find it no more difficult to buy protection from prosecution in a democracy than they did under the pre. There are other mafias. The major labor federations are all still controlled by holdovers from the pre era. Democracy hasn't come yet to the workplace. It hasn't come to many business boardrooms either. Corporate governance is an important issue in Mexico, although as far as I've heard, no Mexican corporation has been found to be cheating its shareholders as shamelessly as Enron or Tyco. Life hasn't changed much in the shanty towns that surround the maquiladora plants along the northern border. 
Foreign corporations pay workers there 10 or $12 a day and virtually no Mexican taxes. So in many border settlements, there's no money to pay for potable water or sewage treatment. During the 2000 campaign, uh, candidate Fox promised to fight underdevelopment and poverty vigorously. The central strategy, he said it would be an educational revolution. He was going to spend umpteen billion pesos to remake the Mexican school system. That's never really gotten off the ground. The government doesn't have billions of pesos to spend um, reforming all the schools. Fox has put forward energy and tax initiatives that would increase revenues, but he can't get Congress to approve them. Fox has in some ways been proven to be a clumsy negotiator with Congress. But the Mexican public itself is divided over the wisdom of these initiatives. Fox has called them modernizing reforms, but um, the left sees them as giveaways to the business class. So the Congress currently is a democratic institution and reflects the ambivalence of the electorate. Fox can't simply, simply ram legislation through in the way that, say, Salinas could 10 years ago. So there's legislative impasse. But let's keep this in context. I read an article in Foreign Affairs magazine a couple of months ago. It called Mexico an ungovernable democracy. America has tremendous problems, too. Our underfunded social security system are microphones that don't work, um, <laughs> sp spiraling health care costs. Does the American political system work any more effectively on these issues? We also a, face a kind of um, political impasse, yet nobody's calling the U.S. ungovernable so far. So let's talk now. What are some ways that democracy has made a difference in Mexico? Take immigration. Millions of Mexicans feel very strongly about the conditions faced by undocumented workers in the United States. We have a vast underclass of Mexicans that work here um, virtually without civil rights. Nearly 500 Mexicans died crossing the border last year trying to get past the guards to do work that Americans want done but don't want to do themselves. Fox picked up on the outrage that many Mexicans feel about this system. And he campaigned in 2000 pr pr promising to press for change in the um, legal framework that governs labor migration in North America. And as it's true, as president, he has pressed these issues much more vigorously than any of his predecessors. In January, President Bush offered a new immigration proposal, his guest worker program. That would help some Mexicans obtain legal status to work here for a time and it would allow them to travel back and forth uh, between Mexico and the U.S. while participating in the program. It does not offer a clear path to legality. I heard some Hispanic congressmen call Bush's proposal, come, work, and adios. It'd be great to see a specific legislative proposal. But what's the point here? This is a case where Mexican public opinion has forced one of our continent's most pressing social issues onto the American political agenda. That's new. This is Mexican democracy making itself felt. Democracy brought a similar dynamic to the diplomacy at the United Nations in the lead up to the invasion of Iraq. The United States in that period adopted a fairly traditional attitude towards Mexico. The message was, you're our neighbor, you're in our backyard, we're counting on your vote at the Security Council. U.S. policies seem to forget that the opinions of Mexican voters now matter. By overwhelming margins, the Mexican people did not um, appreciate the idea of a preemptive war. They, didn't, they don't believe in that. And so President Fox, unlike Jose, um, Jose Maria Aznar, did not lend Mexico's endorsement to that war, to the because the Mexican people didn't support it. Obviously, Mexican foreign policy has differed from Washington's in the past, but this was new. This was not some... Cold War Balancing Act. President Bush seemed to take Mexico's refusal to vote with us at the UN as a personal insult, but this was a decision driven by the dynamics of Mexican public opinion. This, too, is Mexican democracy making itself felt. There's a lot of cheap talk about democracy these days, so how to accurately characterize Mexico. 
The country has a democratic electoral system, but much of its political culture remains stuck back in the authoritarian era. Still, Mexico's accomplishments look deep and genuine when you compare them with the democracy that Washington has been trying to export to Iraq. Last year, occupation officials in Iraq wanted to schedule direct national elections quickly. They couldn't. They were wringing their hands. What was the problem? Well, they found that political parties in Iraq were weak or non-existent. They found that Iraq's voter lists were out of date or inaccurate. During this same period, Julia and I were writing our book, and it was difficult for us to avoid comparisons with all this talk of democracy between Iraq and Mexico. Voter list? Mexicans spent billions of dollars over much of a decade to create a very sophisticated national voter registry with a digital fingerprint embedded in the cell phone, <laughs> embedded in the citizen identity card. Parties? Mexicans fought for many years to build their opposition parties. So again, what's the point? Democracy doesn't flow from the barrel of a gun. Mexican democracy wasn't imported by an occupying army. Mexicans built it themselves. The difference between writing newspaper articles and writing a journalistic history like our book is the difference between making headlines and charting trend lines. In our work in Mexico, Julie and I created a lot of troubling headlines. That was part of our job as, co as correspondents. We had to write about topics that were often embarrassing or difficult for our Mexican hosts. We wrote about drug trafficking, army abuses, dysfunctional institutions. But we were lucky. We had the good fortune to stay in Mexico long enough to see past our own headlines and to realize that Mexicans were engaged, that we were watching the last stages of a long period that was, that was culminating in an inspiring national renovation. We met Mexicans who were feeling new powers, the power to prevent the development of a pristine beach by some hotel chain, the power that neighbors feel when they band together to stop crime or prevent crime, the power that taxpayers feel when they confront red tape at some bureaucratic government office. Eventually, we saw Mexicans move past the frauds of the past and elect their own Congress, a democratic Congress, and eventually a president of their own choosing. Writing our book, we got to chart the trend lines, and they were very clear. Mexicans fought an extraordinary struggle for democratic rights, and they won a great victory. Thank you for listening. Sam, thank you very much, and Julia. Uh, again, since I obviously am not going to replace Oprah Winfrey, I didn't even give the name of the book, but it's Opening Mexico, the, Make the Making of a Democracy. And now before we go into questions and, and comments from the floor, I'd like to bring to the podium the Deputy Chief of Mission of the Mexican Embassy here in Washington, Ambassador Eduardo Iberola. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure he will want to verify the kind things that Sam Dillon said about him, because those in government service should never get too close to, <laughs> to, the, to the press or be lauded by the press, but he is one of the great public servants of Mexico. Uh, he is a Foreign Service officer who, uh, when I was in Mexico, uh, was basically loaned to their equivalent of the Department of Justice, was the Deputy Attorney General equivalent, the number two person in their justice uh, system, and in that capacity uh, did as much or more than anyone in Mexico to build the cooperative efforts between the United States and Mexico to fight common enemies, such as drug trafficking, environmental degradation, uh, abuse of immigrants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's, it was someone that we enjoyed working with because he was a, a straight shooter who looked at the common problems and cooperatively tried to help solve those problems. 
for coming to Washington. He went back from the Justice Department, their Justice Department, to the Foreign Service, was Consul General in Houston, and then just within the last couple of months has been posted here in Washington as the Deputy Chief of Mission, Ambassador Eduardo Iveroa. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Jones. Thank you for your kind words. And Sam, Julia, I am really very thankful to the Meridian International Center to be invited to this presentation because I think that this, uh, this is a very interesting book. Of course, it's a book written by journalists, as Sam said before, and I couldn't agree more. And uh, we have a lot of facts in the book. And of course, we have also an interpretation of the facts. We can agree or disagree with the interpretation. And perhaps some of the, not mine, <laughs> <laughs> your revenge. <laughs> some of the, some of the facts are still to be written. I mean, the evidence of the facts are perfectly, I mean, I'm, I'm a lawyer and I have that perhaps that disadvantage, but sometimes the facts are also in dispute. But uh, this is a, a, a book that make to us a lot of reflections about Mexico and about uh, our current history. As you know, there is nothing new about uh, American journalists writing about Mexico. We have, of course, as you said in your book, the distant neighbors of uh, Alan Reading, but we can go back even to 1908 with the interview, the famous interview of Porfirio Diaz with James Krillman, when Porfirio Diaz said that Mexico was prepared to democracy. That was 1908, <laughs> before the revolution. Um, and the book of, of, of Sam and, uh, and, and Julia, a friend of, of, of me told, told uh, one day that perhaps it's a kind of book that you start reading by the index. I see not my name there, so I was very happy. <laughs> and, uh, but the, the important thing about the book, the main, the main point about the book is that, of course, we are now, and I, I, I am absolutely proud of that, we are now a country with a full democratic system. Of course, and some parts of the book and uh, in the reviews of the book made in other papers say that, well, it's still an, uh, not a perfect democracy. Well, I ask, and I have been professor of political science for many years, what is a perfect democracy? Where is a perfect democracy? But certainly we Mexicans are working on that. And we have a lot of things to do. Our homework is still very, very hard. And um, as someone in the book, uh, some of the sources, uh, a good friend, Sergio Aguayo, said that uh, before, the, before the elections of 2000, we were struggling for a clean elections. Now, our main target is to tear down networks of corruption and to build institutions that work by democratic rules. And this, this Sergio Aguayo said in the book, this is more difficult. Of course, we Mexicans now have a full democratic and political system. We have a clean, legal, transparent electoral system. We just uh, read about uh, a couple of Mexicans that were members of the Electoral Commission of Mexico that is now a civil body, it's not a government agency, that were invited to Iraq to advise the Iraqis in how to create their electoral system there. We Mexicans are advising outside of the world. Uh, of Mexico electoral uh, procedures and systems. It, it couldn't be possible before our transformation. Of course, the electoral system that we have now wasn't built in one single day. It was a process, a lot of changes in previous administration that started perhaps with uh, Lopez Mateos and the, and the Diputados de Partido, the House members with proportional representation at that time, in the times of Luis H. Alvarez, as, as uh, uh, has been said here and uh, finish with the constitutional transformation in the last administration where not only we have a, an electoral system that is completely independent, that we have specific rules about 
campaign financing that are very important because now the elections are really fair in terms that the political parties are getting money from the uh, public treasury. It's not private money, just a very small proportion of the money that is financed for the political parties come from the private sources. And this is also related with the drug money and other illegal sources. So we Mexicans are paying a lot of money for our democratic system. But we have a clean, legal, and transparent electoral system and an independent and judicial dispute resolution body in electoral cases. But as you know, democracy starts with, election, with elections, but don't finish with them. We now, as has been said before, we have a complete freedom of speech. The media, both written and electronic, is completely free. Criticism to the government, to the president, is always uh, on daily basis. It's, an, it's, an, it's, an, it's a national uh, tradition now to criticize everything that is going on in Mexico. And not only, not only the, the official activities, but also the personal life, like uh, in some countries that everybody knows. So <laughs> you don't have a private life. We have now, this is very important, and it was promoted by President Fox and accepted by Congress by consensus, a Freedom of Information Act. We Mexicans now have that kind of law. And this is a very important law for information and also a very important law to fight corruption. Because, of course, we have and to, be, uh, and, and we have to respond to society where the money goes, what we are doing, why we are doing that. And uh, they can ask for almost for everything. Confidential information has to be classified, but also can be declassified. We have an independent and plural Congress. Some of the most important reforms announced by President Fox, energy, tax, labor, are being in, in, in discussion in Congress, and perhaps they are going to remain in Congress for many months and perhaps years. But that happens, that happens in, in, in any democratic society. Uh, there's a part in, 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 in the book that is being said that we Mexicans have more than 400 constitutional amendments. Our constitution was written in 1917. And that's true. We have more, perhaps more than 500 amendments of our constitution. In the past, it was very easy to amend the constitution because if the president wants to do a change, the Congress will accept it. We have a system, I think, more or less the same that you have here. We need a, a special majority in Congress, and then the state legislatures have to vote the amendment of the Constitution. We have a lot of amendments. Now it's very difficult to change the Constitution. But the problem, technically speaking, about the Mexican Constitution is that our Constitution goes to every single detail of our legal life. It's, it's like a ruling our Constitution in some parts. It's not a general body, but it's so specific in, in some areas, like energy, like labor, like uh, others that... You, sometimes you really need to change the Constitution for everything, but that's a matter that has to be discussed in the transformation of the Mexican state, because certainly the Constitution of Mexico must be updated in, in many aspects. Uh, I put you an example. The, the House is the, the body that authorizes the budget, but we don't have a real a strong prescription that what could happen if the House don't authorize the budget for the next fiscal year on time. You know about that. It has happened here. But we Mexicans need to be prepared for that because the budget is now a piece of legislation that is strongly discussed. And that is good for democracy. We, of course, now have a completely independent Supreme Court and professional federal judicial judges. Of course, the judges in Mexico, the federal judges are very well paid. They are professionals. We don't have a jury system. We have a professional judge system, but we have still to work in order, let's say, to, 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 to establish, and, and, and we left when I was the deputy attorney general, we prepared draft legislation, and it's still pending in Congress, to create uh, judges specialized in organized crime. It's not judges faceless or, or without face, like in the Colombian case at the beginning. No, it's just specialized judges that are going to deal with organized uh, uh, crime or terrorists or uh, that they will need a special protection, special preparation, and a special protection for their families because intimidation, of course, is always a problem for, for, for judges. We have now uh, our version of the General Accounting Office that is in Congress and that is an independent body that is going to have the accountability of government. It's working. 
and of course, well, it's going to be developed. And uh, of course, the Fox administration has made enormous and tremendous efforts in uh, having a very strong policy toward human rights. And we are members of a lot of multilateral conventions on human rights that were, uh, in the past, were rejected. And we have a, a strong commitment to fight corruption, conventions and uh, policy, and we just establish a civil service. For the first time in Mexico, a civil service, the law is there, needs to be implemented. But the civil service also helps to prevent corruption. And the civil service goes, of Mexico goes as up, as high as a general director, which is very interesting. And the deep federalism. So we can discuss about uh, the changes that have, been done, uh, have taken place in Mexico, as uh, uh, Julian and, and Sam said before. I think that I, I don't need to add anything else. But uh, the important point is that the book is really, I would say, a mandatory source for everyone that wants to learn about Mexico in, in current times, among the transformation of Mexico to our full, uh, a, a full democratic uh, society. Uh, I said, I, I understand that uh, in, in justice, we are also making a lot of progress, and although the, 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 the road is very difficult and, of course, is not an easy solution. I said when I was the Deputy Attorney General that cleaning the, 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 the police is like trying to fix a car in movement, and that is very difficult, but this, we are working on that, and the Federal Preventive Police and the Federal Investig Investigative Agency from the Attorney General's office, and uh, after the tragedy, because it was a tragedy, and I, 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 I was a participant as, as a witness, uh, first from row witness of, of the Gutierrez Rebollo case that is very well described in the book. Well, the reaction of the government at that time was before the, the, the President Fox administration, but the reaction of the government was to create for the first time in the Mexican uh, judicial system, a judi judicial history, a system, a betting system that is working systematically and that has been established. Every single federal agent that is going to be hired by the Attorney General Office or by the Federal Preventive Police and other bodies must to have a betting procedure that includes the polygraph. That was, that was a reaction to that very difficult situation of the Gutierrez Rebollo case. And um, I want to finish with this. I, 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 I think, Julia, that Perhaps a lot of people are thinking that the, the administration is, Fox administration, as you said, is ineffective. But we have to think something. Ineffective compared with whom? We have to analyze the Fox administration in the framework that this is the first administration of modern Mexico that is running a complete democratic country with a con Congress that is completely independent, with a judicial branch that is completely independent. And uh, I think that we will have to compare what the results of the administration are going to be with a comparison with the next administration that are going to run in Mexico in a full democratic country as we are now. And that, again, we Mexicans are very proud to have that. Because certainly it was very easy to run in the past when you have a 100% majority in Congress, all the judges in your side. Well, that is very easy to govern. I mean, it's very easy to, to run a country. Although, let's keep in mind that even in the past, Within the, the pre-system, they have a lot of internal disputes. It was not so easy as it was a, a monolithic system. It was a lot of the struggles inside the, the pre. But at the end, of course, the president prevails. That is not anymore the case because the president is running a country that is completely democratic and that he has to work every, every single day working with Congress to convince our, our, our legislators and to litigate in the constitutional cases that we have. And well, that is a different Mexico. And I am very glad that both uh, Sam and Julia are optimistic about my country because I am also very optimistic. I just want to finish telling you that I was in Houston with Julia and she was very kind to dedicate his, uh, her, her, uh, their book to me. And she said something about for the fight for the rule of law in Mexico to Eduardo Ibarrola, considering that I was working on that. And I couldn't agree more, Julia. Thank you for these, these words, because I really believe in the rule of law, and I really believe that we Mexicans are doing a tremendous effort the, the, to the rule of law to prevail in Mexico. Thank you. Eduardo, I want to stay here. Eduardo, thank you very much, Eduardo, for three fine presentations. 
Uh, the floor is open to questions. We have a microphone, somebody yeah, with a microphone, if you'll just state your name and ask your question. Uh, I'm Herb Whirl, and I used to be with the World Bank, and, and uh, both the World Bank and OECD have criticized uh, Mexico for the weakness of its public administration, particularly its sexenio, its sexenio system. Uh, I was wondering to what extent uh, your excellent columns, have you been able to look at public administration, particularly the sexenio system, uh, which you can explain, and, and, and to what extent do you see any improvement in this regard, which affects, of course, everything in Mexico, the fact that Mexico is not able to collect much taxes and all the rest of it. Perhaps you'd care to talk about that, either one of you. Thank you very much. Um, the sexenio system is uh, that the president of Mexico serves a one six-year term and is not, by constitutional mandate, um, uh, eligible for re-election. And there is, in fact, no re-election of, uh, across the political system. Um, and uh, the other aspect of this under the PRI was the one that uh, Eduardo alluded to, which was that essentially there was no civil service, so that, so that uh, you know, the, the patronage was, was um, not just a part of the system, it, it was the system. The PRI was, in a, sen in a sense, a, a, a very large political machine. Um, uh, I think there is a widespread consensus today in Mexico that one of the first things that has to happen is to begin to um, have, re -elect have re election of lawmakers, of federal lawmakers and local lawmakers. And this is, this will, uh, I don't, it's even possible that this could happen before the end of Fox's term, I think, um, because there does seem to be a strong sense that this is urgent. If you don't have uh, your, your, especially your, your representatives, your lower house of Congress, if those people are not um, uh, eligible for re-election, then you really never get, they never acquire any kind of sophistication. They can't, you can't build legislation over a period of time. You can't, you can't really even make the kinds of long-term alliances to around, you know, major issues that, um, that you need to have when, when the issues on the table, for example, are something as deep as um, allowing private investment in the energy industry or in the total overhaul of the tax system, which is, um, one of the big issues that's on the table. So the advent of the civil service, I think, is a tremendous step. It's obviously going to take a long time for that to have an effect. And the pos you know, stay tuned and see if they get a uh, re-election of, uh, of, uh, of lawmakers at the, book, at the federal level. Okay. Other questions? Over here, this gentleman in the front. Mike will come up to you in just a minute, then we'll call on you. This gentleman right here in the second row. Don Peretz. One aspect of the relations between Mexico and the United States is the constant movement of tens of thousands of Mexicans northward across the border into the United States. Uh, since these reforms and changes that you've described have come about, has there been any decrease in this movement of Mexicans uh, northward into the United States? Sam, do you want to we'll alternate? I don't think there has been. Uh, I, I believe that um, actually the, the latest reports have been that there's more uh, movement across the border in the Latin the period since President Bush uh, spoke about the, his immigration proposal. It's um, given some people in Mexico the idea that they might be able to um, take advantage of that and get involved in a, in a, in a program um, in which they could get some sort of legalized status. The, the dynamic that drives immigration is that there are about um, somewhat more than a, 
uh, a million young people who come onto the labor force every year in Mexico. And in good years and bad um, years, it, the, the economy there does not produce more than um, a, a fraction of that number of jobs. And so there is a, a tremendous deficit in unemployment. And so that's uh, driving um, the immigration issue. It's something that our country really needs to uh, address because uh, it's, it's, it's a political issue for both countries and we need to work on it um, with considerable urgency. Sure, Eduardo. Uh, I, I think for a, an analysis of migration, we have to consider also that uh, our economies are really integrated now. For, first of all, the Mexican, the Mexican economic policy is, of course, the, dedicated to keep Mexicans working in Mexico. That's the main goal. And we have had financial stability for years, and uh, the transition from President Cedillo to President Fox was without any big surprise in the fi public finances and the public macroeconomic figures. We didn't have the valuations. We, we have a, 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 a smooth transition. The point is that also, for migration, we have to keep in mind that the Mexicans are coming here to work because they find works here. The economy of the U.S. is demanding that works, and uh, we, in a sense, are providing that workforce because the economy of the U.S. and also this is important to remain competitive needs the, Mer the Mexican workforce or the workforce from elsewhere, or either the jobs of this country are going to move elsewhere, like we are uh, seeing now in, in, in stories about moving work jobs from here to India, to working computers or whatever. So that is that is a problem of the global economy of the global economics. So we have also to keep that in mind when we analyze migration. In a sense, we are filling the places, the empty places that the the, the, the the American market is demanding. This lady here in the fourth row. I must congratulate you both very, very much for the book. I, this is the third time I come to this interview. I read it twice. All my friends got it and said, why you have a copy? And I'm sure you also sent me a copy. And I must say, this book is very, very admirable. Because on the one hand, it is very informative without taking the superficial aspect of the common stories. Nor does it have all the expertise of the experts, which write very boring. <laughs> On the other hand, it is so incredibly important that there is not one trace of paternalism in writing. Whatever you refer to or report, you are always practice reflection about your standpoint and your perceptions, which is a tremendously valuable element in this book. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll have to take very sharp disagreement with you. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me also say that. She is not a member of either of their families. Right. <laughs> this gentleman right back Can here. Can we put you on the road? And maybe, uh, uh, in the next row back. You want to turn the mic on and give it to this gentleman here? My name is Joe Dukert, and this question asks for speculation. And I'd be interested in the opinions of any or all of the people up there. What effect do you think it will have on the elections of 2006 if half a million to a million Mexicans living in the United States do vote, at least in the presidential election. We were talking about that beforehand. Who wants to take that on? Uh, well, I think um, we're not sure because, um, um, I mean, my speculation would be that we really don't know because and this is, has been a disenfranchised group. And, um, you know, there have been many assumptions. The pre-system before Fox's election made the assumption that these would be voters that would probably be hostile to the authoritarian system because, after all, they couldn't find jobs in Mexico. They ended up being in the United States. And so uh, the, 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 uh, the pre-fought, um, uh, the possibility of enfranchising Mexican voters uh, in the United States before Fox's election. Um, but I don't think we really know. We, you know, it's a huge population. It 
represents all of Mexican society, I mean, of working class Mexico, and that's a very diverse group, politically diverse group. I, I don't think we, we really know, uh, you know, how they would vote. I think we all agree that to have an efficient process starting from ground zero to allow eight million people or so to vote is going to be enormously difficult and it has to be approached with great care. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Terry Shaw, and I was wondering, oh, could you please tell us how the PRI has changed in the last four years and what kind of a showing they may make in 2006? Well, the, the PRI's greatest accomplishment in the last four years has been that it has survived uh, because I, in the days after um, the, the election in um, 2000, it was it was really uh, very difficult times for every, every member of the PRI. Hi, Terry. I haven't. <laughs> um, uh, and I have to say, I'm kind of uh, uh, literally people, the m longtime members of the PRI were um, walking out of the PRI headquarters with all of their belongings in cardboard boxes and, you know, and fighting and. Um, and threatening each other in front of the cameras, and it was a very, uh, very gloomy period. And they have um, gone on to have party elections that uh, they united around a candidate, and they have uh, won uh, regional elections, and they are um, operating within the political rules as a uh, center-left party, and so. I think that the biggest change is that they've gone from being a completely discredited party in power to a party that has some credibility now as an opposition group, and um, we'll see if they, they, you know, they have more, they, they still have more governors than any other party, so they they're, have a good base in every state, so, you know, they could even win. And I'm going to assume the ambassador does not want to tackle that question. <laughs> one, of, one of the changes is that they are making primaries. Yeah. They are making primaries. They are, they, they, up to now, choosing nobody knows, choosing for the candidates. Nobody knows up to now who perhaps is going to be the candidate. They have 10 candidates, potential candidates. That is a huge change. Um, a, a couple of things. One, the PRI is the only party that really has a national structure. Two, and this drives some people crazy when I say this, but the, I, I believe that the PRI in ideological terms represents a kind of mainstream in Mexico that still exists, which is it's a nationalist party, it is a welfare state party, it is an anti-clerical party. Um, and so there's an ideological basis there for the PRI to, to, to use, that makes it uh, a mistake, I think, to discount the PRI. Current, their current leadership, they, they have elected the old guard. So Roberto Madrazo is one of, you know, you know, deeply corrupt politician who has become the president of the party and may be their candidate in 2006. And, uh, and we have great anecdote. In, in our book, here I'll give you, I'll, I'll take this opportunity to do a little advertisement. We have in our book an early confrontation between Roberto Madrasa, who may well be the pre-candidate in 2006, and a man named Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, who is currently the mayor of Mexico City and is very likely to be the candidate uh, for the leftist PRD in 2006. So if you want a preview of this possible confrontation to see who these people are. Read this book. Uh, but I, my, I, I would predict that the PRI will lose by a long shot in 2006, and that will precipitate a new cycle of reform within the party. And, you know, I would say don't count them out in 2012. Yes. One more question back here. Hi, how you doing? Um, my name is Michael Gorino. I'm with an international student organization called ISEC. And um, I had the opportunity to live in Mexico City the last four months this last semester. And my question is with regards to the black market economy and um, corruption in that sense, and excluding drugs and all that. Because something that I witnessed was that um, 
like it's a pretty vibrant economy and a real big chunk of the economy. And I was wondering, you know, they have these things called tianguis, which are, you know, like stands and whatnot that are really important in the Mexican city economy and how that, like corruption is influencing that because there's a whole mafia behind all that and stuff. So. Okay, who wants to comment? Well, the only uh, black market uh, street black market that's larger than the Mexico City street black market is on Canal Street in Manhattan. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that's not the answer that you, you were looking for, I guess. Um, uh, the black, the uh, under, the informal economy is uh, is an important factor in every Latin American capital, um, from Rio to to um, Lima, you, you've probably traveled around, so you know. It, uh, it's, uh, it, tourists who travel to Latin American capitals and find it difficult to walk on the sidewalk because there's so many um, marketeers tend to form a negative impression of the, the informal marketeers, but in fact, they provide employment for huge numbers of, of uh, people that aren't being employed by the formal economy. So. Um, it's a fast. Uh, you, you probably know a lot more about it than I do, but I, what little I've looked into it, it's a fascinating um, culture, cultural, uh, economic culture that uh, is. Uh, I guess I'd advise people not to form quick judgments about it. It, it performs functions that um, aren't necessarily what you think on first impression. One of the, one of the purposes, perhaps not the major purpose, but one of the purposes of the tax reform that uh, the Fox government has put forward and has been espoused by a number of economists is to bring that informal economy into the formal economy so everybody can sort of pay their fair share. And then the tax system as it is now works against that. Let me thank all of you for being here for the questions. The, the one thing I thought about um, that this book clearly illustrates in the advances of democracy, but it, it, it puts forward a number of the traits of the Mexican people that I found there, one of which has been a great sense of humor. Uh, in the 1994 elections and again in the 1997 elections, we worked closely and tried to assist in every way we could to, to help the Mexican government do what they wanted to do to bring off clean elections. And uh, so, and I was trying to get back to the United States to tell Americans the kinds of things that were happening there. So, on one occasion after the '94 election, I think it was, we were—I was speaking to an audience here with the then Mexican ambassador to the United States, Jesus Silva Herzog, who came from a political background. And I was trying to explain the great advances in democracy and said that for the first time, the Mexicans are going to allow exit polls. So that within two hours after the election, because of these various exit polls, they will be able to call the elections, the winners, and how the elections turned out, which is a, a great uh, check on fraudulent election problems. Ambassador Silver Herzog got up in his turn to speak. He said, you know, this is not so impressive. When I was in the pre, we used to be able to call the elections six weeks before they occurred. <laughs> In any event, thank you all very much for coming. The books are out there. Thank you for all. Julia Preston and Samuel Dillon won a Pulitzer Prize in 1998 for their New York Times series on drug-related corruption in Mexico. Opening Mexico was published by Farrah Strauss in Jeru. For more information, visit fsgbooks.com. It's July 4th weekend, and you're watching three days of book TV on C-SPAN 2. Coming up at 11 a.m. Eastern, a look at how groupthink impacts our culture. Then Thomas Allen considers espionage during the Revolutionary War in his book, George Washington, Spymaster. Tonight on Book TV, mark the 141st anniversary of the final day of the Battle of Gettysburg with Carol Reardon, author of Pickett's Charge in History and Memory. After that on Public Lives, a biography of William Clark's career after his expedition with Meriwether Lewis. 
And at midnight Eastern, Blood Done Sign My Name, author Timothy Tyson on the murder that sparked the civil rights movement in Oxford, North Carolina. Whether writing about the evolution of the Constitution or the history of the presidency, 